Hi, this is All Things LGBTQ, our interview show. We'd like to acknowledge that we're taping in Montpelier, Vermont, which is unceded indigenous land. And we'd, I'd like to welcome you to the show. If you have any suggestions about who you might like to see interviewed here, please let us know and we'd be glad to check it out. Um, Thanks for coming, and I hope you enjoy the show. I'm here with Hunter Ohanian, who is the executive director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archives. Welcome, Hunter. Thank you, and it's great to be here. It's nice to see you, uh, even though it's not in person, it's virtually, but it's, uh, it's great to spend some time with you. And welcome to Fort Lauderdale. Welcome to the Stonewall National Archives. Thank you. You know, I've been to Fort Lauderdale and I've been to the huge gay complex that you have, the center, but yeah. I didn't realize that you existed or I would have visited in person, but you know. There's well, time. it's another reason for you to come back. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, let me tell the audience a little about your illustrious history. Uh, you joined the Stonewall National Museum and Archives as executive director in October 2019. Previously, you were the head of the College Art Association, the largest professional association supporting art historians and visual artists in the world. Prior to that, you were a founding director of the Leslie Lohman Museum of Gay and Lesbian Art, the only museum devoted exclusively to artwork that speaks to the LGBTQ experience. And that is such a contribution. I love that museum. I go every time I'm in New York. It's such a, an important um, institution. So shout out to the museum and to you as a founding, as a founding director. Um, prior to joining the Leslie Lohman, you are the director of the Foundation for Massachusetts College of Art and Design in Boston. Before that, you led two renowned artist residency programs, having served as the president of Anderson Ranch Art Center outside of Aspen, Colorado, and director of the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, which is the largest residency program for emerging artists and writers in the United States. The Fine Art Work Center recently permanently endowed a fellowship in your name. That's impressive. Yeah, thank you. That's very nice. Uh, you have a long career of nonprofit board and community involvement. You're the past board chair of the Alliance for Artists Communities, the national membership organization for artist residency programs. You graduated from Boston College and received your law degree from Suffolk University. You have an honorary doctorate of fine arts from the Art Institute of Boston. So you're a resident, you're a Renaissance person, a lawyer, a supporter of the arts, a writer, and let's go to your um, writing. Having authored countless articles and papers, in 2014 you completed the figure-based project titled Self-Portraits by Others featuring the work of more than 50 artists who used photography in their work. In 2015, along with Robert W. Richards, you released Stroke, From Under the Mattress to the Museum Wall. In 2018, you released The Reprobate Sense, the illustrated version of Peter Damien's Book of Gomorrah. I love that title. <laughs> Let's talk for a minute about the uh, publication Stroke. Sure. It uh, contains steamy illustrations from the 1950s to the 1990s. Yeah, it's, it's, it was based upon um, an exhibition that we had done at Leslie Lohman. Uh, Robert Richards and I, Robert um, has since passed, but uh, he was a wonderful I illustrator. Uh, here's actually a copy, and, and um, this is uh, a piece of Roberts as well, too. And so the, what the exhibition was about was, and what the book is about, is the idea that there were many gay male artists who did beautiful figurative work um, in an aesthetic sense um, that was used in many of the gay male magazines. For them, this was really their personal work. 
Um, a lot of them at the time were doing illustrations for Bun Wit Tellers and Bloomingdale's and a lot of the big ads that you would see in the New York Times at the time. But they were doing that to make money. Uh, this was work that, that really sort of reflected themselves and the community around them. And the only avenue that they could show it at the time would be through some of the gay, um, the gay male skin ma magazines. But beautifully, beautifully re rendered uh, photo or, uh, drawings. So that's what the exhibition was about. Um, we had actually, we brought that exhibition here to Fort Lauderdale at the time. Uh, we brought it to uh, San Francisco. I think it traveled to two other cities as well too. But so what the book is, is a series of, um, of uh, biographies of the artists and, um, and then several pages for each artist of their, their work. And it's, people can uh, get it. It came out, as you said, I think in 15, but they can go to Amazon. I, I know it's still being sold and at different places. You know, Tom of Finland is in it, right? Of course, Tom of Finland's in it. I mean, some of these names are, you know, um, this is kind of the who's who of everybody from Antonio to Bastille to Tom of Finland, Colt. Some of those early Colt drawings are so beautiful. Uh, David Martin, Mel Odom, who is doing beautiful work t today. Um, Acquaintance, uh, Richard Rosenfeld, Tom of Finland. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a beautiful collection of work that was very important. And, and the reason why it has the, the name that it has from under the mattress to the museum walls is really for a lot of, uh, of gay individuals, this work had to be secreted away. It, it was kept under the mattress or someplace where somebody else wouldn't see it. And it was a wonderful opportunity, as there have been many more now, about bringing out gay work and uh, putting it up on the walls and letting people actually see it. Well, you know, to give you an example of the divide between lesbians and gay men, uh, when Tom of, Tom of Finland came up in some context, my partner and I didn't know who he was. And we mentioned him to our co-host, Keith, who was appalled. You don't know Tom of Finland? He brought in a book. So now I'm educated about Tom, you know, and we all could, many of us lesbians could use a little education about some of that early gay art. Well, and it, of course, you and I are old enough to remember that at a certain time in the 60s and the 70s, 80s, you know, there was a fair, and I think AIDS actually brought a lot of gay men and lesbians together to work side by side. Um, uh, but, you know, there was a, certainly a fair amount of sexism that went on in, in those days. And, and it still happens t today as well, too. I think we're far b better than we were 30 years ago as a c community. Um, but, you know, for, and it has to do with so many things about being gay. But as a young man growing up gay, you had to identify with, with strong male images. Otherwise, if you appeared effeminate, you would be outing yourself as being a homosexual or being gay. And so that's why there was an importance to be, to be even hyper-masculine. And I think that's what Tom of Finland brought to people. He brought, he brought a sense of hyper-masculinity, which right now may feel a little toxic um, because we've been, we've been so steeped in it in so, for, for so long. But for, for gay men of the time, he was pretty important. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Rhode Island, um, and then I went to Boston to go to college and, um, uh, and ended up living in New York for uh, t 10 years, which was great, before c coming down here to Fort Lauderdale. I love New York. I went to college there and then stayed a couple years after I graduated. Great. And then when I was in New Orleans, I didn't go back for like 10 years. And what a, what a loss. But now that I'm in Vermont, before the pandemic, I used to, you know, I was able to go fairly regularly. But let's talk about a reprobate sense, the yes. illustrated version of Peter Damien's book of Gamora. I love the title. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, 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 the title of it is really Peter Damien's words. And just to remind everybody, uh, 12th century, 1100s, uh, he was a saint, um, and, but he had the ear of Rome at the time. And he wrote, um, he wrote the book, what ended up being called the Book of Gamora. I think it was Letter 41. Um, 
And he just laid out all the sins of, of same-sex attraction or same-sex action, um, primarily between men. He, and the sexism is so clear that, that, quite frankly, at the time, they couldn't care less what women were doing. They were only thinking about what men were, were doing. Um, and then you read, his, you read his background and what was going on, and he had been orphaned as a child. He'd been abandoned as a small child, and his brother his older brother uh, rescued him. He was actually, as a small infant, living in a pigsty. Uh, and the brother actually uh, saved him. And he took his brother's name, uh, P Peter. And uh, anyway, so he went to live in a mo monastery. Uh, he was very w well trained. Um, and he then went into the church. And then he stayed in the church his entire life. Um, and did... Sorry. It's okay. And then, and, and so then he would be writing letters uh, to Pope Pius, I um, can't remember the n number. Um, and then this letter 30, or this letter 41 came out, and it's where he laid out all of the sins um, that were associated with same-sex attraction. And he even went so far as to detail specific acts and then talking about how long it, you would be in hell for, ha for or, or in pur purgatory or go to hell for, for co committing these particular acts. So the, the l little book that I did about it, it so a reprobate sense is, is his own words. It was about a sense that individuals had who committed the, those acts. So it's definitely t tongue in cheek. And then what, what I decided to do was I used um, uh, 1970s gay porn, but sort of blurred it. And that's how I made the illustrated version of Peter Damien's <laughs> reprobate sense. So that the idea was just to really nail it, right? You know, make it absolutely clear that this is what the man was speaking about at the time. Historically, it's important because this is really, you know, this is really where the anti-gay movement within the Catholic Church was really baked. I mean, clearly it had been around for a long time and, and there were a variety of ups and downs. Um, but again, this was also at a time in which the Catholic Church was fighting uh, about all of the things that were going on within the church itself, such as you, you could buy uh, you, you, you could buy your, your t title as a priest or as a bishop, and, and, and there were so many things that were ha happening. Um, this was the least of their worries <laughs> at the time. Um, but it's, it's what actually, those of us, um, you know, in 2020, we're still living the consequences of these decisions that were made, um, you know, so long ago, and, and are so baked into our culture. And, and it's not just you and me, and it's, it's a 20 year, year old who's just trying to figure out what their life is about or, or who they should love or, or not love. Exactly. In the five minutes we have left, tell us about the Stonewall National Museum and our, our archives. It's important that it's national because it does have a national scope. Yeah, it is, it is definitely national. Um, just to give you just to give you a sense, like right behind me, um, you can see this is part of the library. There, there are twenty eight thousand volumes and books here in the library. It's it's believed to be who, who knows, but it's believed to, to be the largest LGBTQ library in the world. Um, all cataloged under the Library of Congress system, um, and so the, right here, you're in the fiction section here. Um, and uh, this is all open and available to the general pu public. Um, we are actually open uh, d despite COVID. I mean, here you can just see like, here's the Amistad Ma Pen section here. We're, uh -huh. we're, in, we're in the M's here. Um, over here is biographies. And uh, it's almost all gay, although there are some gay adjacent people here. So, you know, here's the life of Judy Garland. There are <laughs> a number of books about Judy Garland here. Um, so, so this is the library part, and then we do exhibitions, um, and these exhibitions are based primarily on items in our archives. This is a show that just went up last week called Elected Sisters, Pioneering by Lesbian and Trans Political Leaders. So right here, you're looking at Kathy um, Kozinencho, who is the very first open uh, open lesbian elected in the United States in uh, 1974 in, in Michigan. Um, here's a, 
first publication of something she would have been reading at the time called The Lesbian Connection, which is still in um, existence today, but here's a very early copy. Um, uh, Elaine Noble, who was the first open lesbian elected to the state legislature in Massachusetts. May uh, I interrupt you with a personal reminiscence? I came out in 1975 in Indiana, and I went to my first LGBTQ conference in Bloomington, and Elaine Noble was the keynote speaker. I was, I mean, she, she really energized me, and the other uh, speaker was Leonard Mantlovich. I'm dating myself, but these are really important figures, so I'm glad that you're um, highlighting them in this exhibit. Yeah, no, and, and these are these are people who these women, you know, really are pioneers. I mean, here's Deborah Glick. Uh, she, I think, she's in her thirtieth year. She was the first open, uh, open lesbian to be elected to the New York um, State Legislature. So this exhibition is good. So in addition, so what, also what we have here is I'll walk you around and we'll take a little look at the archives quickly here. This is another exhibition space we have. This is a, um, a quick little exhibition we put together of some things from the archives. Uh, we have many, many publications. Um, and let's take a quick peek over here. Oh, yes. Well, if I may, a lot, all of this is available online for those of us who aren't uh, at, at liberty to go to the archives personally. You have public programming, you have tours, um, you have, I mean, I, one could spend days there at one's laptop. <laughs> well, it, you know, it's astonishing. And, and again, so for example, well, just to give you an idea as this, this cabinet is open. So here you're seeing New York Native, you know, the oh, entire original that. run. Um, here is uh, Frontiers. Um, uh, here's Washington Blade. Oh, uh, yes. That's still publishing. Yep. It's still, but again, these are complete runs of, of all of these, uh, all these publications. Seattle Gay News. Um, mm -hmm. Philadelphia Gay News gay news. So from a historic standpoint, um, this stuff is inc incredibly valuable. And then we do subject uh, headings as well, too. So just open up this one drawer here. Log cabin Republicans to a uh, long time coming to Los Angeles Gay and Lesbian Center, Los Angeles Research Group. And so it's, um, it's, it's almost endless as to all the subjects Here's lesbian front, uh, lesbian feminist, lesbian feminist, uh, lesbian ethics. Uh, this is a public, do you know this publication, Lesbian Ethics? The lesbians and their- Yes, lesbians. and I might have a copy, yep. but I wasn't um, a philosopher. I read some lesbian philosophy, but you know, not much. So it gives you just a quick idea of, you know, of all of the stuff that we have here. Um, we have probably private collections of maybe 150 people. Um, and what will be coming up soon, everybody should go to our, our website, which is stonewall-museum.org to learn about all the stuff you were just saying, but also to see what we have in the archives. And I put that out there for two reasons. One, we're always looking for more information. So if you have things in your attic in some place that are gay, know that organizations like us exist. And we always say, let us throw it away. Don't you throw it away. Send it to us, put it in a box. You, you know what Andy Warhol used to do? They're still, do he would just take his arm and just sort of take everything on his desk and just put it in a box and they'd seal it up and they put it into an archive. Well, we all need to take all of our gay stuff and do the same thing with it. Don't worry about it, just put it in there, send it here or if you have some other gay archive, and then let us make a decision about whether or not it should be saved. Because what you might not think is important um, is very important to do document our history. Well, thank you, Hunter. Are, are there any, in the half a minute we have left, are there any final words you'd like to share with our viewers? Well, just, just keep up. I think we all just need to keep on doing the good work that we're, we're doing about trying to make ourselves safe and comfortable, but also trying to make the next generation safe as well. 
So thank you for, for, for your time. And thank you for coming. We'll thank have you. to come back to talk more about it. Okay, anytime. Hi, everybody. I'd like to introduce our illustrious Vermont poet and uh, James Cruz. Uh, welcome to the show, James. Thanks for having me, Linda. I know we, we uh, read together once um, at the LGBTQ reading at the library. That was a lot of fun. Um, so let me tell the audience a little bit about you. And James Cruz's work has appeared in Plowshares, Raleigh Review, Crab Orchard Review, and The New Republic, as well as Ted Kozer's American Life in Poetry newspaper column. And he is a regular contributed, contributor to the London Times Literary Supplement. He holds an MFA in creative writing from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a PhD in writing and literature from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. The author of two collections of poetry, The Book of What, Says, <coughs> what Stays, <coughs> Prairie Schooner Prize, and Forward Book of the Year Citation in 2011, and Telling My Father, Prowl's Prize 2017. Cruz is also co-editor of several anthologies of poetry, including Healing the Divide, Poems of Kinship and Connection. He leads mindfulness and writing workshops and retreats throughout the country and works as writing coach with groups and individual. He lives with his husband, Brad Peacock, in Shaftesbury, Vermont. So, there you go. And this is uh, James' new book that just came out recently. And I will have on um, the webpage uh, when this airs, it'll show where you can purchase that book. So James, where are you from originally? So I was originally born in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, my parents were both born and raised in that area. and. So I've lived to a lot of different places now all over the country. And when did you arrive in Vermont? Like a long time ago or? No, actually, um, I arrived here, I guess it's been about five years ago now. Um, so I was living in Providence, Rhode Island and um, teaching in Boston and was really kind of tired of the city and um, wasn't in a relationship. And so I ended up meeting the man who would be my husband um, online on a dating app, actually. And um, I mean, I thought it was a joke How when cool I first saw that? it. What's that? How cool is that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I thought it was a joke when I first saw his profile, like a fake profile or something, because he said, organic wow. farmer living in Vermont. And I'm like, well, why is this organic farmer in Vermont looking at my profile in Providence? But of course, you know, because of the low population here, you know, you have to look a little bit outside of the state. Um, and I ended up meeting him halfway in, in uh, Brattleboro and we had this kind of marathon first date. So I pretty much fell in love with Vermont right after that and in love with him too. So started going back and forth and then eventually moved here. An organic farmer. And so you are the organic farmer's husband. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> kind of a romantic story, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, it's very enticing, an organic farmer. Like, wow, that sounds, that sounds great. <laughs> so, did you have any influences growing up? Did you always, did you always write poetry? Have you tried other genres to write in? Yeah, well, I always thought I was a fiction writer, um, I think because I thought that was the only way you could make money <laughs> writing um, and be, be successful, kind of make that your life. Um, but I was introduced to poetry at a very young age in the third grade. I had a teacher, Mrs. Brown, who um, asked us to memorize a poem every week, and um, which seems like, you know, unimaginable now. But um, that was still going on then. And and then I think I got the idea. I was inspired by, you know, like Shel Silverstein, I think I was reading a lot then. And, um, 
you know, the few books in the library that were poetry collections. And I just thought that I would write my own poem one week for like show and tell or something. And of course, my teacher was thrilled, you know, and I was always super shy. So I have no idea how I mustered the tenacity to stand up in front of people and read my own poem, but I guess I must have done it. Um, maybe I blacked out afterwards. I don't know. But uh, but that kind of got me started writing. And I think I've never really stopped since then. I would like make up cards for family members and write a poem inside and um, and just find little ways to to keep writing poetry. Well, I really found the poems about your father um, absolutely beautiful. And, um, and you make it look so easy. Oh. Um, you know, like just getting across the sort of the pain I was, I, and, and what one that really stood out for me was when you were talking, because I, it really, I related to it because we had similar experiences with Anne's mother was, which was, you know, not letting her eat whatever it was she wanted to eat. And all she wanted to eat was birthday cake. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we sort of gave up and just let her eat, eat the birthday cake. Um, and um, so that really stuck with me. I, I thought it was a beautiful poem. I, I thought they were all really, really, really good poems. And, um, you know, speaking about some very hard subjects in a in a very accessible way is, is an important thing, I think, for a poet to be able to do, and not easy, really. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I really enjoyed Bluebird, and I, I imagine that you would, you would like to read a poem, if you wouldn't mind, uh, reading a poem from your new collection for us. Absolutely, yeah. Um, let's see. So... Maybe I'll, maybe I'll read the poem. Um, I mentioned the, the marathon first date with my husband, Brad, in Brattleboro. And um, one of the things that we did was um, we went to Putney Mountain and just sat up there. And so I wrote this poem actually after that experience. Um, and I think they also call it Hawk Mountain because a lot of people watch the, the hawks migrating, especially we're kind of getting to that time of year again. Um, so this poem is called First Date, Hawk Mountain. We sat together on the grassy mountain where the sun shone clear and hard on our faces as we inched closer. The stone beneath us soaking up our heat and giving us back an ancient cold that told of a love larger than the self. I shivered when you took off your gloves, when you took off my gloves, and kiss the hands that touched you for the first time on top of that mountain I knew we'd always carry within us, muscle and bone of the place where birders gather to trace the hawk's migration as they cross overhead. I had this vision of a thermal sweeping in and lifting us into the same welcoming blue as soon as our lips finally met. But when I came to, we were still earthbound, of course, seated on grass and leaves, eye to eye, arm in arm, keeping each other warm. Oh, that's really nice. How does your husband feel about that? Does he, <laughs> does he get a little shy when you read about it or is he sort of like, oh, that's me? <laughs> yeah, I think it's the latter. I think he, he's like, oh yeah, this is nice. You know, I like being acknowledged <laughs> like this. Um, because I asked him once, you know, there was a, I think after the last book I came out, had come out, I was doing a lot of readings all over the state um, with some friends, and I was reading some of these new poems too, and I asked him one night, like, does that really bother you? Like, please tell me if, you know, I shouldn't be sharing some of these personal things, and he said he really loves it. Um, so I appreciate that because I know that not every poet's partner feels that way, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're, you're lucky, you lucked out in a lot of ways there. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, you went to Wisconsin, Madison, University mm -hmm. of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my partner also went there, got her PhD mm -hmm. there. It was, did you like Madison? It was kind of a. Yeah. Small I really loved it. I yeah. Did. 
I, I, I love Vermont more, I'll just say that, but, yeah, um, <laughs> but I still have great friends in Madison and um, I really love going back there to do the occasional reading when one can do these, these things again. Um, yeah, it's a great, it's a great city and um, I think really supportive of the arts and, and very liberal. So I always felt really at home there and the program that I attended was really supportive. A big LGBTQ community there too. Mm -hmm. Definitely. How many years were you there? Um, I was just there for two years, so 2005 to 2007. And so do you, you teach, do you really enjoy teaching and students and working with people's writing and, you know, because that's a whole other skill set, mm -hmm. um, you know, really to kind of find that, that way of teaching that's supportive, but also um, critical, which as writers, we know if you, if you, if you have to be able to take critique, you have, in order to grow, you have to really be able to get a hard shell and and mm -hmm. accept those rejections or whatever it is and and so uh you enjoy teaching and you and you find that to be fulfilling in a lot of ways i do actually yeah i mostly work with younger writers um younger students at suny albany um and they're typically from 18 to 20 years old and um they're actually quite a diverse group too so i i love you know we we are somewhat lacking in diversity here in Vermont. So I feel like, you know, when I get to see them, I, you know, just get a taste of how other people are living and, and sort of, you know, the experience in the city, which has been challenging for them during the pandemic. But um, I, I really do enjoy teaching. It's a delicate balance, as you say, of, you know, trying to encourage, but not discourage too much. Um, with our feedback and with any sort of criticism that we offer. So what I do with younger writers especially is just really encourage the effort and maybe point out a few places where, you know, they might think a little more deeply or, um, you know, make some changes because I think that a lot of students got discouraged in high school, especially when it came to poetry and they sort of didn't, weren't really exposed to living writers or contemporary poets and especially accessible poetry, which is, I feel like just my thing. Like I really, I really believe in lifting up accessible poems that people can understand and really relate to. Not that that's the only kind of valuable poetry, but it's, um, it's the poetry that has helped me the most and that I value the most. So I love sharing that with those students. And then I teach a lot of private workshops too and do one-on-one -on -one work. So really kind of every group and every person requires something different. So that's what makes teaching really exhausting sometimes. You know, you have to kind of modulate and really stay in touch with your intuition whenever you're meeting with someone, which is still possible um, via Zoom, which I was worried about when the pandemic happened. But you know, I do find it's more difficult, but you can still get a sense of kind of what people are looking for and what they need. I think it's really important work. Um, yeah. So I, I would like to ask you to read a poem before we have to say goodbye for this mm -hmm. session. So sure. if you could read one more sure. poem, we'd really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, so I'll read uh, this poem. I've been thinking a lot about kindness. So my uh, last anthology, Healing the Divide, was all about poems of kindness and connection. And um, so this is a poem where I try to define, think about how kindness uh, lives in us. It circulates like blood in us, like rivers flowing into the ocean, or it moves through a room like air coaxed to blow cooler by the blades of an oscillating fan. It is the sweating glass of water your lover brought and left for you on the nightstand before bed. It's the woman I watched once on a plane smoothing her daughter's hair back from her forehead over and over, running her fingers through the curls until the girl slipped into a deep sleep, resting against her mother's shoulder. It's the held door, the pause that lets another go first and you feel the heat of it pulsing near when a father waits patiently 
while his son chooses a single ripe fig from a bin at the grocery store and holds it gingerly in his palm as if it were made of blown glass and might break open at any moment. Oh, well, thank you, James. And um, our audience will be very glad to see you and um, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Well, thanks so much for having me, Linda. Okay. So well, one of the things that I was actually talking about with today's guest just before we started taping is that how Zoom was allowing all things LGBTQ to visit parts of the state where we may not have been before. And even though Vermont is a relatively small state, getting from one end of the state to the other isn't necessarily all that convenient or all that easy, particularly since the majority of our time we're dealing with winter. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the guest for today is from Bennington, which is yeah. a place where people from, you know, Burlington, Montpelier may not have spent a lot of time visiting. So this is Lisa Carton, who is the founder and current director of Queer Connect. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> thank, you, th thank you for agreeing to come on. So looking at some of the history relative to Queer Connect, it identifies that you moved to the Bennington area about 30 years ago. So where were you prior to 30 years ago? And what drew you to Bennington in particular? Yeah, um, I was actually in Albany at the time. Um, I had moved up to Albany to get my master's degree and um, I had a partner there and she actually got a job that took her uh, to Bennington and so I was, you know, driving over a lot and I loved it. I immediately was like fell in love with it. Somewhat ironically, part of what I loved <laughs> was that there were little grocery stores on uh, every corner instead of little bars. <laughs> I remember saying, wow, other places I had lived, there were little bars on every corner. And it was like really refreshing. So um, I just fell in love with, with, with Vermont and um, we moved to Woodford shortly thereafter. Um, and uh, my life went through major changes um, from being a foster parent, which was amazing, um, to uh, then just, uh, I moved away actually. I, um, in, I was in Baltimore when 9-11 happened and I wasn't really loving it down there anyway. So after 9-11, I was like, you know what? I'm back. I am so back in Vermont. And I, I hit, the, I got back. Um, and I've been back ever since, started my private practice. I'm a psychotherapist in private practice. So, and that has been, you know, amazing um very grateful i love my work i have the best clients it's just incredible so uh, i've been doing that geez since pretty much 2000 2001 2001 yep so um yeah and then one of the one of the difficulties i had well when i first was in i was living in bennington outside of bennington actually but i was commuting so and i worked at in AIDS work in Albany. So I was surrounded with a LGBTQ community in Albany during the day and I would just kind of go home. And for a long time, I didn't know anyone. I didn't have friends and I didn't know anyone. And I, I would, I remember so distinctly, I'd see all these pink triangles on cars and I'd say, okay, where is everybody <laughs> for years, for years. And finally I just moved, I moved to Bennington and then even more so I was like, where is everyone? Like my mantra for years, it was not a happy mantra. Um, it was rough. It was like, you know, and then I met a ton of lesbians because, you know, they're all social workers and, and therapists like me, <laughs> <laughs> all partners and lived together for years and years and years, um, and kind of just stuck together. So, you know, there was no visible community ever, ever. There was a few little things here and there that they, that they weren't able to laugh. Um, and finally, like t about two years ago, I was driving down the road for the umpteenth time, <laughs> someone, another parent called me. So one of the, one of the saving graces for years and years has been outright who has, I've been on their list of resources and they've been wonderful every year. They would say, 
anything different? Can we still refer people to? And I was always like, wow, there's good stuff happening for LGBTQ people, but not here, you know? And, um, and that one day when I got another parent calling me about their, their, you know, their, their kid, and I had to say, well, there's not, <laughs> they, they told me, we Googled it and you came up and two other people, and those are two people I knew who didn't even live in the area anymore. One of them isn't even LGBTQ. So I remember like driving saying, oh, God, I'm so sick of this. And I caught myself, I mean, I've said that a lot. And then it hit me like, I don't wanna be sick. I don't wanna be sick anymore. I don't wanna be sick because of this. <laughs> Boing, little voice said, just create something and don't worry about space, just create something and it'll, it'll happen. So I just started Queer Connect like that week. And literally, I had people coming to me. I got an interview in the banner and then boom, I had an AmeriCorps Vista worker who approached me and said, what, can I work for you? And I, by the way, I have money. What, you come with money? We have to do pride. And literally that was like maybe three weeks after I had that little thing, like I have to just start something. And she said, yeah, and we, that's how it, it started. That was like in March and pride was June 30th. So from March to April, May, June, basically like worked nonstop around the clock and we had our first pride which i don't know it was pretty legendary in my mind um nobody expected it to be as as amazing and big and incredible um even me i kind of knew but it's nice when what you think can happen happens <laughs> and then <laughs> exceeds your expectations oh i, I want to step back a little bit because you touched a little bit <clears throat> on what might be really helpful information for people watching this who live in other parts of Vermont that are rural. Yeah. When you went about reaching out to the LGBTQ community in Bennington yep. to try and pull Queer Connect together, how did you do that? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. So. I like have lived in the area so long and done various um, jobs and things that I knew a lot of people. And I basically just expanded on that network. And I just literally, my middle name was Pride. Pride, Pride is the key for our success. So um, we call ourselves Queer Connect. And actually that's been a double-edged sword. I think we would even be more successful in some ways if we didn't say the word queer because a lot of, um, especially older LGBTQ people, they don't like that word. They get offended by it. And um, younger people embrace it more. Um, and it was, an, it was a very intentional choice. Yet Pride, my middle name was Pride. I, I talked about it nonstop to my LGBTQ friends who basically said the same thing they almost always said to me for years. It's like, well, you know, that can't happen here. And, and on that day, I literally had, I can't tell you how many of my friends who have lived in the area, oh my God, you really did it. I can't believe it. I know I thought you couldn't do it, you did it. It really opened up, it really like opened up some kind of, I don't know what, for the town. And, and the other piece is engaging our allies. It was so, you know, we have so many allies who really want to show support and maybe haven't even called themselves allies because there's not a visible community to ally with. How do you ally with something if there's not a community to ally with? But when you say we're having pride and we're gonna do this and a lot of our allies know about pride. So it really helped. Pride was the momentum that pushed that out. We, we hit, it was very grassroots, completely grassroots. I hit the farmer's market every weekend. I was there, I talked it up like crazy. I have everywhere I went and I know a lot of people. I met people like crazy at the cafes and I, I just um, engaged everybody I could think of. And then I just was shocked myself. I thought I knew everybody living in the, in the town, which is a small town feel for sure. And I met so many people that I never knew were in town, especially gay men, which I had missed because at ben Bennington's, it's like the lesbians and the gay men are like separated. It's like, I missed that. So yeah, it was really, really, really incredible on so many levels and and now i have to say it's still challenging because especially with covid you know we were we were poised to do our really really big second pride when covid hit almost all of it was planned 
because I like to plan things ahead of time. And we didn't have planning ahead of time last time. So we were like really planning ahead of time this time. And then it hit and, you know, um, I lost, I lost my board of directors, um, most of them. Um, and we lost our, our funding for the year, our primary funding, which was going to be, you know, our sponsorships, our pride partner and pride sponsors. So um, it's been challenging. And now I have to say, it's like, I feel lately, it's a struggle for me because I feel like just, I'm so happy to be on this show with you. Oh, something gay, Keith Herring in the background and Keith in front of me, yay. Because I feel so disconnected and I know that has to be the experience in town because how can it not be? Everybody was coming up and saying, crying to me. Everybody cried for a long time after Pride, everybody cried when they saw me crying. Oh, I know, me too. So it, it's an interesting thing. I don't, I'm rambling a little, but it's still a little overwhelming for me to think and process everything that happened over that basically a four month period. And then we had such a great response to Pride that I got a little bored from it and that we became an uh, activities oriented board and we had a lot of activities. October, we had a coming out day, Halloween parties, um, Trans Day of Remembrance, we supported it. We did all this stuff. And then basically when January hit, um, people, we all went in. We had, we had really nice holiday gatherings, like five of them. Games, all, it was fun. It was, and I'm very proud of, see, this is partly the answer to your question too. Um, we, I've engaged like every age, lots of kids. Our primary like focus was on our youth. So um, I think that helped us too from the get go to be, you know, hitting and, and, and we're very diverse. I'm so proud that we are like the diverse group. Some the meetings we had were the most diverse meeting I've ever attended in Bennington. I would sit back and go, I can't believe we're in Bennington. This is so amazing. So what is it that Queer Connect is able to offer now, or, or at, are you at a position where what you really need are volunteers and people to come forward to give another momentum to move into the next step? Because it sounds as though this very similar to other LGBTQ plus organizations right now, due to COVID, everybody's in transition. Yes. So we made the transition right away to doing things online and we did not get a good response to participation wise now I think it's one of those things that's hard to gauge because a lot of people will watch recordings of stuff that you do after the fact so our presence is 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 pretty I think people know we're here now I know because we I still get calls from parents got one two days ago so that is happening but for the for the organization itself I'm happy to say that um, I, I have a brand new board and I'm so excited about that. We could use two or three really committed new members and then we'll be really rocking it. We're rocking it anyway. We have a new sort of vision and um, this is pretty cutting edge. I'm so happy to tell you about this because I haven't really put this out publicly, but we're looking to acquire um, some land and have queer land in Southern, Southwestern Vermont. Yes, it's true. And we want to, um, we, it's pretty radical actually what we want to do. We want to form a small, I live in a tiny house and I'm, I'm, I want to move my house into the country. So uh, I've been looking for land for a long time. It hasn't happened. I think this is why, I think I'm meant to do this. Um, I know I am actually. So we found this amazing land and we're right now very much in the process of looking for investors, including people who want to be stewards of the land. I have three people now and live tiny and ecologically in harmony with the earth, um, honoring sacred Mohican land um, in, you know, in Pownal is where we want to be, which I never thought I would say. <laughs> what is this is like, um, this is like, we're putting a big push out right now, actually. I've raised quite a bit of the funds um, to acquire it without requiring a bank because the bank straight out told us it'll be three to four months before we can even touch this because of COVID. So anyway, um, the big upstart, the, the big point here is anybody who's interested in supporting an LGBT, LGBTQ organization from the ground up, literally, this is the time we really could use, um, we really need loans, uh, private loans. Uh, like I said, we have two of them already. If we have two more people who can do a loan for us at, at a very 
it's a win-win, 12% interest. That's a really good investment. Um, we could acquire this land immediately. We have such plans. There's an amazing barn that we want. But we, we created the first Southern Vermont LGBT archive last year. And it has been planned to be housed at the Bennington Museum. They're a major uh, supporter of ours. Um, but I, I think this barn is supposed to be our archive and venue. I see okay. it. Of artists, we have a lot of musicians locally. Um, it, it's it feels like a destination and a place where we can uh, actually offer affordable, community-supported housing for people in transition, our young people, um, homeless people. It, it, we know we're the highest risk for all these things, right? We know it. So anyway, I'm really super excited about this. Um, and that's what we're putting our energy partly into now, which is a huge new sort of vision. But we have never had a space. Queer Connect has never had a space. So we did everything we did without an office, without storage space. It, stuff is all over, scattered all over Bennington. Um, and I feel like it's, it's imperative for our sustainability to one, have this paid director position we're creating so we can sustain the organization, but mostly to be rooted in the land. It feels Vermont to me. It feels like what we're supposed to do. It sounds, now, very, it sounds very familiar. So I will make sure all of contact information is up. And with awesome. that, I need to say thank you. Oh, and, thank you. And I want to check in in six months and see yeah. how this venture is going. So Lisa Carton, Queer Connect, thank you very much for being on All Things LGBTQ. Thank you, Keith. It's really good to see you again. So that was our show for this week. Thank you for joining us. And Linda. And as our weekly reminder, do not forget resist. to resist. <laughs>